Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, here we sit on the backside of Christmas with the holiday season in the rearview mirror behind us. The presents have all been opened, the family meals consumed, at least for most of us. Soon the Christmas decorations we unearthed a few months ago from the attic or the basement will have to go back into their tubs for another year. You've said so long to your visitors and guests and the kids will soon go back to school. The Valentine's Day decorations will certainly make an appearance in the next few weeks and normalcy will return to the world again. But I suppose this is why the backside of Christmas is often referred to as the post-Christmas blues. Because for the days leading up to, and the week of Christmas, leading up to Christmas preparations and Christmas itself, the problems of the world were ignored, or maybe even swept under the rug. The loss of someone we love was filled with the laughter of friends and family, The broken relationship was momentarily forgotten. The diagnosis was ignored, only to be thought about again after the holiday rush. Well, the holiday rush is over, and here we are. The radio stations will go back to playing their regularly programmed productions, whereas just weeks ago we were singing joy to the world, and it's the most wonderful time of the year. The Christmas spirit has worn off, and the world is returning to normal. Our gospel text this morning is very bah humbug, in my opinion. And as I sat down to write this sermon, before the joy of Christmas vacation with Sarah and I's families, mind you, I had regretted preaching on it, uh, because it's not really on theme for the season. In fact, it's not one of the better-known gospels at all, because it doesn't feel very gospel-y. Something very few people realize, and I myself had to be reminded, is that after the hustle and bustle of that first Christmas came to an end for Mary and Joseph, they actually stayed in Bethlehem, anticipating that this is where they might raise their child. Eight days after Jesus' birth, they made the six-mile journey to the temple in Jerusalem for the child's circumcision and naming. Some 30 so days after that, they made the trip again so that Mary could be purified because according to Jewish law, she was deemed unclean after giving birth. And then they returned to Bethlehem and they set up their home and their lives. And we know this because this is where the wise men found them. And yes, I know, this really puts a damper on the whole the wise men were at the manger thing. Uh, But let's go back to Matthew 2 where it says that actually... The wise men did not find Jesus in a stable or a cave. They found him in a house. Because if they saw the star, and if they came from the east, it's probable they had to travel about a thousand miles or more, a trip that would have taken anywhere from one to two years. So, while the wise men traveled, Mary and Joseph made friends. Joseph found a job. The infant Jesus started to grow up. In what his parents thought would be a safe, small suburb near Jerusalem. A fine place for any young Jewish family to prosper. But Herod had different plans for the family. Two years after seeing the star appear in the sky, and after two years of following it to see what the big deal was, the wise men arrived on King Herod's doorsteps. The Magi had come from a long line of stargazers. And throughout the history of their people, the story had been passed down about this massive star that would one day appear in the sky and that whoever sees it should follow it because they're going to find a great king on the other end when they get there. Well, where would you expect to find a king? In Jerusalem. At the epicenter of the ancient world, in a palace, they find a king but not the right one. They instead find a paranoid and enraged Herod who seethes at the idea of another king who will knock him off his throne, but he keeps his cool. He sends the wise men to Bethlehem because this is where the Jewish historians say that the king would be born. And he says that once the wise men find the king, they should return to him so that he can go and worship this king as well. But of course, we know that to be a farce. He wanted to go 
and eliminate this threat to power. So what was the problem? The wise men don't return. They take a different road home. And this leaves Herod with only one choice. If the star appeared at the king's birth, and if the magi had been traveling for two years, then every male child under the age of two in Bethlehem must be slaughtered. And this is shocking to us, but not to a man who killed two of his own sons and his own wife, thinking that they were a threat to his power. So soon the silent night of Christmas is flooded with the sounds of weeping mothers. Hmm. The backside of Christmas. Now, dear friends, it would be very easy for us to get caught up in the bah humbug of this text, and indeed it cannot be softened. To imagine the pain and anxiety of Mary and Joseph would be unfathomable to you or I because you or I have never been forced to flee our homes to a foreign land with an infant child in our arms and a tyrannical murderer on our tail. To leave under the cover of darkness and flee knowing full well that others will die while you will live. To imagine the heartache and the sorrow of mothers cradling their children who had been killed in a senseless massacre, cooing in their crib one moment and struck down the next. Indeed, it would be very easy for us to slip into those post-Christmas blues, but today, on this last Sunday of the year, as we wrap up 2019 and look to begin a new decade in just a few short days, I ask the question, what kind of world did we think Jesus Christ was going to be born into? A perfect one or a broken one? What kind of world do you think God was sending his son to live in? A peaceful one or a raging one? And it's on Sundays like this, in fact, the last Sunday of the year and the first Sunday we celebrate after the pomp and circumstance of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day where we are reminded that God sent his son to be born of a woman, to be birthed into creation, not because the world was void of suffering, but because we needed a savior to walk with us through our suffering. We are reminded that God sent his son into the world to grieving people, people grieving death. People grieving the loss of independence, grieving dysfunction in their family, grieving war, grieving finances, grieving chemotherapy. How much I would love to stand here this morning and say that the problems of 2019 won't follow you into 2020. I would love to stand here today and say that it's the most wonderful time of the year. We'll carry you into the next decade. I would love to stand here this morning and say that in the, the next year, there won't be brokenness and violence, and imperfection, but we all know that that would be a lie. Because the truth of the matter is, in 2020, we will know both the peace of a silent night and the weeping that these mothers experienced, at least on some level. We will ebb and flow between joy and sorrow and highs and lows and ups and downs like Mary and Joseph. Our paths will be curvy, and our trajectories will be shaken and so much unknown. And on our own, this would be intolerable. On our own, this would be unthinkable and even terrifying. But we are not alone. And this gospel text serves as a reminder of this. For God spoke to the wise men and Joseph in a dream, warming them of the trouble that would come ahead. God appeared again to Joseph when Herod's son ascended to the throne and continued the reign of his father, Herod, landing Jesus' family in Nazareth instead of in Bethlehem. Through the wise men, God provided Mary and Joseph with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, precious commodities that could finance their trip in Egypt, some 175 miles away from home. In a world that is plagued by sin and troubles and threats, God reminds us that there is not one road that is not known to him. Have you ever wondered why the phrase, do not be afraid, comes up so many times in the Christmas story? 
when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary to tell her of Christ's incarnation in her womb, when the angel appears again to Joseph to explain that the child in Mary's womb would be the son of the Most High, when the angel choir fills the night sky around Bethlehem, above the shepherds, in the fields, the message was always the same. You have nothing to fear. And this is the message we take with us into 2020. Amidst all of the unknown that is to come, we have nothing to fear because God is with us. As he was with the Holy Family in Egypt, but today he is not with us in dreams or through the mouths of angels, but he is with us in bread and wine. For his son, who was spared as an infant, grew up, and the day came when God would no longer spare him from death, but in fact he would raise up his own son on a tree for your salvation. And on this post-Christmas blues Sunday, we stand in awe that the manger was transformed into a cross. And we see with our eyes and taste with our lips and feel with our fingertips, Emmanuel, God with us, with us today, with us tomorrow, with us in the year ahead. You have nothing to fear. The one who escaped death one day died for you, was raised for you, and is preparing a home in heaven for you. Amen.